Welcome, everyone, uh, to the latest installment of uh, GSHED's uh, Ecology of Education series. Um, this is a series that we use to showcase uh, the research uh, of our early career faculty um, and to give them an opportunity to share with the community some of the wonderful work that they are uh, have been engaged in and are, and are currently engaged in. Um, following on with this semester's theme, we had uh, Dr. Parker from Counseling uh, for our first um, Ecology of Ed um, lecture this semester. So um, sticking with the need for more counseling and more human development, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Bagmi Das uh, to, for today's Ecology of Education lecture. Um, just a couple of logistics. The, the session will be recorded. Um, only Dr. Das will have audio and video um, enabling while she is presenting. And then once that presentation is done by Dr. Das, then we'll open it up for uh, questions and contributions from our participants. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce Bagmi, Dr. Das. Um, she's an assistant professor of counseling and human development. Um, Bagmi's um, fields of expertise uh, lie in trauma intervention, family therapy, and in the multicultural and, soci and social justice development of counselors in training. So as I noted to Bagmi, just think of us all as counselors in training today. And um, that will uh, allow you to be feeling really wonderful and comfortable about uh, presenting your work to us. Uh, Dr. Das also um, has done uh, research in the fields of multicultural counseling, uh, counseling and also for those who are seeking support across cultural contexts. Um, she is particularly uh, interested in uh, trauma experience in populations who experience intersectional barriers to mental health. And simultaneously, she, as I note, has been um, conducting research into creative andragogy as it relates to counselor identity development in the context of social justice and multicultural interests. So Bagmi, Dr. Das, with that introduction, I'd like to hand it over to you uh, to uh, present your uh, work today on sexual violence in South Asian American women and how they seek support uh, as they experience and seek to get trauma um, support after that violence. So Dr. Das, it's over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Green. Um, so I, I just wanna let you all know that I know the Dr. Green reviewed a lot of my interests and a lot of my research. I am going to focus today because it, my research is very varied, um, though it's all flowing around this multicultural and trauma lens. I'm going to focus my research today on research that I've been doing for probably the longest amount of time. So this specific research um, presentation will discuss a couple different studies, um, but this is revolving around the themes of support seeking after sexual violence in South Asian American women. So before I get into the agenda, I thought I'd share a little bit about why I got into the research. So in case you cannot tell, I am a member of the South Asian community and a woman. Uh, prior to getting involved in even the counseling field, I had special in-group access to the South Asian community because I was part of it. And I realized that mental health was not discussed when things happen to people, whether it be that they had a bad grade versus a traumatic event. It was usually kept in the family, kept tight, and when I got to college and my eyes were open to this whole world of mental health, um, I also developed an interest in becoming a sexual assault advisor. And I worked with a lot of women, varied um, ethnicities when I was working with them, but I still had this passion for how does our community, the South Asian community react to trauma and how do we seek support after it? 
So I'm going to explain a little bit more about my why when I get to the background literature, but I just wanted to give you a situation for where I came into this from. So today we will be going over a little bit of background on South Asian Americans. I understand that generally the general population doesn't necessarily know about South Asian Americans specifically, let alone the AAPI community, since it is one of the smaller races in um, the US, although that is changing rapidly as we speak. Um, I will also discuss with you my theoretical frameworks and why I approached the research from the way that I did. I will discuss support seeking behavior as per the literature before I got into any of this work. And then I'm going to review the studies that I've done as well as the findings. I will be happy to answer questions about the details of the studies in the question and answer portion, but because of the time limit, I will stick to kind of summary um, of the quantitative studies and more descriptive results for the qualitative. After that, I'll follow up with some implications for counseling South Asian Americans. So what does this all mean? Uh, and I know that I have some students on our call, so hopefully this is helpful and future directions for where I'm planning to go from here. So let's start with a snapshot of South Asian Americans. So first I'm going to South Asia. So it's not a monolith, right? It's not just one place. Um, South Asia consists of um, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives, which are these little islands down below. I don't, I think Maldives are usually the ones that uh, people forget because they're in the ocean. Um, Afghanistan has been debated whether or not it fits in the Middle East or South Asia, but given that I had participants that self-identified as South Asian and Afghani in my study, I am including them in this. Um, South Asia has diverse languages, religions, and practices. So when I kind of consolidate them into one group that I'm researching, it's not to say that I'm ignoring all these diverse languages, religions, and practices, but I am considering some of the commonalities and culture that I'll discuss in the next couple of slides. So given that I've explained South Asia a little bit, just <laughs> bare minimum, I'm gonna share a little bit about the South Asian immigration to the United States. So it is considered a diasporic movement. Um, a lot of people that are in the United States that identify as South Asian did not necessarily come here straight from South Asia. So um, due to indentured servitude in the past and opportunities abroad for South Asians in the 1800s and early 1900s, you will see many people here in the United States today that came to the US from India or Afghanistan or Pakistan, et cetera, via the Caribbean or via Af uh, countries in Africa, Kenya, South Africa, both have large populations. And then they've settled here. So South Asian Americans now here, also not a monolith. Um, the AAPI community overall has actually some, the largest income inequality of any race. So I want to acknowledge that in the people that I've studied, I am looking at people that have come here with no money or with plenty of opportunity with um, religions that have been discriminated against, religions that have not been discriminated against. There's a lot of nuance to their experience. But I am now gonna switch us to focusing on the commonalities, but first discussing theory to explain those. So because I was working with sexual violence, I approached this from feminist theory lens. It also aligns very much with how I think and how I practice as a clinician. So it makes sense for me. Um, but in the case of this research, feminist theory frames the experience of sexual violence as that of power. And the social messages that the survivor receives create differentials in power and define how they might act with the powers that be. This also means that I am looking at the dominant discourses and I cannot understand dominant discourses in an immigrant population without acknowledging acculturation. So acculturation in the way that um, I look at it and John Berry, who is um, a pretty 
prolific researcher of the culturation is that it is not necessar necessarily a unidirectional acculturation. Rather, when people arrive in a new place, they are both engaging in acculturation of their new dominant ethnicity, or sorry, <laughs> dominant messages in the dominant society, and enculturating themselves in the ethnic community. And this makes a lot of sense for South Asians because South Asian communities in the US largely describe themselves as a third culture community, which means that they are neither fully Americanized or aiming to be fully Americanized, nor are they trying to go into their community. Rather, there are many South Asian groups that are either religious, social, cultural, dance or activity based that allow for a enculturation into their ethnic society while they're similarly sitting in the world adopting the dominant society. Moving forward, if I look at the support seeking literature, I understand that through this feminist theory lens of what are the messages that survivors are receiving. So support seeking overall in the South Asian community is defined by the concept of collectivism. So collectivist communities typically try to honor the good of the whole over the good of the individual. This means that when something happens or when somebody is experiencing emotional strife, the priority goes to keeping things within family, to not bring any shame or um, dishonor to the family itself. This means that for professional services, even though South Asians have demonstrated some of the highest rates of anxiety, suicidal ideation, and depression among the different ethnicities that have immigrated to the US, uh, South Asians, along with the other AAPI um, persons, use the fewest services. So why is this? Um, there are several barriers to seeking support in the South Asian community, and I haven't even got into sexual violence. So before even thinking about sexual violence, there is a struggle in the South Asian community um, because of this internalized model minority concept. So um, first, the model minority concept, as um, I think many of us know on this call here, it's not proven, it's an idea that was propagated not by um, people of color, but by the majority to create a differential and try to make it seem like some immigrant populations, some uh, populations of color were doing better in the US than the others. However, and while that has been chopped down um, several times, there is an internalization of that model minority concept, at least the literature says so. Uh, so this affects support seeking in two ways. One is that they want to save face. Um, the idea of going to somebody and putting it out there that they need help impacts their internalized concept of model minority. The other is if something happens to them and it is perpetrated by a person of the community, they do not want to disclose the crimes because they want to keep the model minority concept go, um, going as well. The other thing, and this is when it comes to discussion of sexual violence, is that discussion of sex, dating, etc., is very taboo in the family in South Asia, which means that it is hard to define the experience because you don't have any anybody in your family to talk to it about talk to about it further in south asia itself there is a lack of formal sex education which means words such as consent uh, penetration etc are not explained which means that if somebody experiences sexual violence they might not have the actual words to talk to anybody to figure out whether or not they're what their experience was and how to define it. Um, we also know that the values and attitudes towards sex are carried through um, immigration into the United States. So if 
um, somebody's parents, grandparents, great grandparents did not experience formal sex education and did not have the language to develop these understandings, they likely are not passing it down to their children and they're not bringing it into the home and the discussions. I do think, and uh, knock on wood, I think that my research is showing that this may change. So I'm crossing my fingers and really excited. Um, but then there's another big reason that some things have changed. And this also showed up in my research. Um, in 2012, there was a rape case that was highly publicized internationally um, that took place in New Delhi. And I'm not gonna go into the details, but it was a very gruesome case of rape. And when it went into the global public eye, South Asia, specifically India in that case, had to do some hard introspection as to what was happening in society that this happened. Um, and there was, just to let you know, there were a bunch of witnesses and um, people didn't do anything. What was going on in the world that this happened? And then further, how are they going to address it? So since then, there has been kind of a resurgence of a women's safety movement um, in India specifically, but there have been more discussions on the Western end by South Asian Americans about this. So after all of these, all of this information I had about how South Asians communicate and look for support and sexual and how they understand and define sexual violence. I tried to figure out the family is not, the family is who people would usually go to. They're a collectivist society, but the discussion of sex is taboo. But there's discussions that might be able to happen on a different plane because of the nearby incident. So what do survivors do? So my first questions started when I was at Penn State, um, which is my graduate program. I tried to figure out survivors, who will they reach out to? And realistically, when they reach out, what types of reactions do they receive from their supports? I did use an acculturation lens to understand this. So in this first study, I did cross-sectional survey of stand, uh, with using standardized question, questionnaires and open-ended questions. I had 77 participants that completed all of the work. Um, and in this, I found two main, I found four main things. First, I found that in this particular research project, it did not matter whether or not they were immersed into the dominant society, Western society, or their ethnic society. The more immersion they had, the more support they sought. So this was good news. This was just saying that the more immersed they are in any kind of community, the more support they have overall. So we don't need to say that, yes, Western culture, having more language about mental health or something like that is gonna give them more support. It's possible that they can find support in their own enculturation um, in their ethnic communities. Further, I found um, between the type of acculturation and type of support sought, that your the type of acculturation, whether it was dominant or ethnic, um, acculturation had no significant influence on whether or not they sought formal support. So not only were people seeking support period, but formal support was not necessarily mitigated by any barriers that were related to acculturation. I then looked at social reactions that they experienced. Um, and this was using the social reactions questionnaire. I found that there was a significant positive relationship between the number of supports used, which could be from either enculturation or acculturation, and the overall positive reactions they received when they sought support. I did see that there was a difference in family members' reactions. Specifically, it, it, the people received more positive reactions from female siblings than parents. So that was critical. And the other part was that there are significantly more emotional support and overall positive reactions from friends. So in conclusion here, we saw that acculturation did not influence the support seeking, but we found out that more support, better reactions. 
in the open-ended responses, which I did have on this, just to kind of explain the data, I just asked about what was helpful, what was not helpful um, after their experience of sexual violence. And there were some brief anecdotes about finding new coping skills or finding support in friends and being dismissed by family. Uh, so very diverse experiences and I wanted to know more, which led me to my work here at GW. And I apologize for breathing, breezing through that part because that was all background to the work that I really want to present today, which is what is the experience of support seeking for survivors of sexual violence in the South Asian di diaspora? I conducted a phenomenological inquiry into support seeking experiences for the survivors of sexual violence in this process. I conducted semi-structured interviews with 20 participants that self-identified as sexual violence survivors. These participants did identify as having heritage in India, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. So Sri Lanka, the Maldives were not represented in this sample. Um, I also found, that also I have to note that they were talking about their own support seeking. There was no intervention that I inputted to find out about their experience. Through this, we, and I say we as myself and three other doctoral students who I do not know if they're on this call, hello if you are, we found three overarching themes with six sub-themes to describe this phenomenon. First one, and I will be sharing some quotes in the next few slides. So I do wanna share that some of the quotes can be frustrating to see, um, upsetting to hear. I ask that if that is, if it is frustrating for you, please, I will not be offended if you need to turn off your video or go somewhere. Um, I just wanna make sure that you all are forewarned about that. So in this research, my first theme that I found was emotional stress and cognitive self-blame influenced the support seeking. So the participants described their experience of sexual violence as well as their cognitive understanding of violence through the narratives from their cultural and family influences. And they talk about their emotional processes through all of that. So let's first talk about emotional stress. So this sub-theme reflects a collection of the participants' feelings about themselves during and after experiencing the sexual violence. Uh, they shared a lot of themes of shame, which you can see in this first quote, um, where participant two said, I didn't really have anyone I could tell. I thought that they would blame me if they knew what would have happened. I just internalized the shame. Similarly, you see participant, participant five, where she said, I experienced probably a lot of shame. In terms of my community, religiously speaking, I didn't know who to talk to or who would be ready to listen. These participants shared these feelings of shame, dissonance, and also loneliness in what they were experiencing that emerged from both their experience of the sexual violence and their own understanding of how others viewed them after their experience. Their emotions of shame and dissonance negatively impacted their likelihood to seek support and how they sought support, while the overall feelings of loneliness were indicative of how shame and dissonance isolated these participants from the loved ones from whom they might have sought support. The other part of this theme was cognitive processing. And you can already see how some of these emotional stressors are talking about how they then processed how they would seek support. So this participant, 17, shared, I couldn't quantify my trauma to them. They were talking about their family in a way that felt like it was that bad. And so I just never really felt it could be that bad. I think when I was younger, I was just struggling to label what it was. So I would just share with details, but not say what it was. It took me a really long time to come, terms with, come to terms with labeling what happened to me, what it was. And you'll notice that even in this quote, they keep calling it what it was. It was very hard for this participant and for many others to explain what they had experienced as sexual violence. Many of them 
um, unfortunately shared that their experiences started when they were young as children and their experiences compounded, but at no point were they given the words or the language to share exactly what that was, whether it was molestation, um, groping, sexual abuse, sexual assault, rape. They weren't able to use these words. So they situated their understanding of their trauma within their cultural understanding. And in this case, they talk about how they didn't know how to explain it to say that it was that bad. This, this then added to some of this internalized self-blame in their emotional processing. So to a great extent, the participants' understanding and perception of sexuality, their sexuality, and their sexual violence was influenced by both their family and cultural values when they were brought up. Also, participant, uh, this participant also, different, different participant shared that culturally, I don't think Indian culture really helps with not feeling that way, which in that case, they're talking about shame. I know growing up in a lot of that, in that sort of those types of, I don't even want to call them values, but those types of things saying, you know, you, you shouldn't engage in sexual activity before marriage. And even as a kid dealing with advances from disgusting people, you know, my mom would sometimes make comments like you shouldn't have been wearing that, the shorts or things like that. So I know inside, I just feel a lot of shame from the incident in general. And you know, I just feel dumb and I feel dirty. So you, in this quote, which is hard to read because you see them talking about themselves in um, such a negative light. In this quote, you do see how the normalization of sexual violence and kind of the blame that their mother had put on them when they were younger leads to how they're interpreting this new incident that they experienced as an adult where now they perceive this as their fault and they feel like they made a dumb decision and now they are dirty. Um, and this was especially important to understand why they may not have sought support from their family in this process. So the next themes that I'm gonna go to we'll talk more about the support that they did seek. So in theme two, we talk about their interpersonal processes and in experiences of support seeking. These are both from formal counseling experiences and informal interpersonal reactions, and sorry, interactions. Within the support seeking overall, participants did talk about some of their barriers to formal support and elaborate on what encouraged them to look for professional services. Um, and participants also shared some of their negative interactions, such as the one I just described, and some of their positive interactions and what they've sometimes described as allies in their friends and siblings when they divulge their experiences. So let me start talking for, first about formal counseling experience. So people saw counseling for several reasons, um, none of them, interestingly enough, being their physical assault. Rather, people cited insomnia, uh, non-suicidal self-injury, so that might be cutting, self, sorry, self-cutting, self-burning, et cetera, school stress they cited, and some people even cited relationship distress. But nobody went to a counselor or therapist or a psychologist for their experience of sexual violence, which I found to be very fascinating. <clears throat> so while we, when we talk about the formal counseling experience, it's important to know that none of the survivors are talking about how they sought support specifically for their experience of sexual violence. One of the participants did share that, um, and this is participant 15, they shared, I remember a couple years after college, I had gone to a physical and the physician had given me a note to go seek therapy. I had explained I'm starting professional school soon and I have some stress and certain things that I think I need to resolve. And I wanna be able to start my life on a fresh slate. So you'll know none of that is their experience of sexual violence. So she had given me a note 
and I remember hiding it between my mattresses because I didn't want my parents to see it. In this quote, we see both their referral for counseling being a physician, um, not self-referred necessarily. We also see that they went to counseling for a reason other than their experience of sexual violence. And we see that there is still that taboo in talking about mental health with their parents um, and so much that they wanna hide it. Participant nine shares a friend's referral. And this was overwhelmingly what I saw in many of the quotes. This, so this is pretty indicative of an experience. Uh, participant nine shared, it was in college, I think. I was just going through a tough time and one of my best friends was like, hey, I've been going to the on-campus counseling because I'm also feeling overwhelmed. Why don't you come with me? So when she was going for one of her sessions, she literally brought me, I filled out the form, I did the triage, and that's when I started actually regularly going. So it's this case where you see the power of a friend just saying, why don't you try it? Why don't you see? Similarly, oh, sorry, before I go into the next one. Similarly, it's, um, we had a lot of participants that talked about siblings, taking them to their first counseling experience or suggesting the counseling experience. But again, um, not for their experience of assault or violence. When they did have their formal counseling experiences, people shared both po negative and positive experiences, but largely the negative experiences came from dissolution of boundaries. So this is one example of um, dissolution of boundaries where participant two shared, I feel like she, the therapist, kept trying to box me into a category or a diagnosis. We never really addressed anything. Like I never really talked about my trauma with her, for example. I also have a bit of resentment towards her because at a certain point she started doing family therapy. So as you can see, first of all, they did not even talk about their trauma with this therapist, but the therapist themselves started uh, bringing in family therapy. And if I were to keep going with this person's interview, it was that the therapist decided that their, the issues are mainly with the mother daughter relationship. And uh, so the, the participant never felt comfortable sharing their trauma with the therapist because there was never an opportunity to do so without their mom also participating. Um, I do also want to share with you some positive experiences that people shared. Largely, this was due to validation they received in counseling about their experience. So if you all remember, I talked about how hard it had been for people to define their experience of sexual violence. And in this case, they were finally able to receive some validation. Um, participant four here shared, that was the first time I had openly discussed with anyone about what had gone on in my childhood. And I think I just connected to her because I felt like she was the first person to validate my feelings so openly too. They also, oh, that was the same thing. Um, they also talked about their informal interpersonal reactions, which is the next slide. In seeking support from informal sources, participants did receive a range of reactions. Positive reactions were always about empathy, encouragement, motivation. However, some participants also received doubt, questioning, invalidation, and blame. Both, though one participant out of the 20 mentioned telling a parent, most participants shared their stories and experiences in disclosing to siblings and friends. Many mentioned sisters, which I discussed before as kind of a referral source. And so here in participant 14, we can see her words where she describes her sister. We've always been close. So she ended up telling me about her experience. And I think one thing just led to another as we were talking and venting about just how disgusting some people can be and how it shouldn't take for someone to have a sister or a mother or whatever to understand that it's just a wrong thing to do to another human being that I ended up telling her. So in this case, the sister had a similar experience and they were able to talk about it. Female friends were also mentioned um, similarly because they were able to talk about like experiences. However, 
there are while some people did receive receive validating responses from their friends, they also received other responses because when um, the perpetrator was a mutual friend. Uh, participant H shared that some of their friends said, "Like what? Seriously, he did that? Are you sure?" Um, and in this case, they're seeing that their friends don't necessarily believe them. <laughs> Moving on, I will talk about theme three, and then I will bring this all together. Theme three is what I was more most excited to share with you all. Um, I find I found this to be the most enlightening of many of the themes because I haven't talked, I haven't seen much about it in the literature. And I can see how this transfers into research I will continue into the future. So the first sub theme in that is societal change. Oh, sorry. The theme three is cultural and societal dim dimensions that influence support seeking. The first sub theme in that is societal change. So this reflects general changes in attitudes towards therapy and specifically therapy for sexual violence. Participant 19 shared, there's so much support now. Just five years ago, there wasn't. And I can only imagine how bad it was 10 years ago. Others mentioned social media, such as the Me Too movement and Instagram posts, um, specifically Instagram posts that were South Asian oriented in nature. Um, and even more specific to that, Afghani oriented or Pakistani oriented in nature. Um, more specifically in societal change, people pointed to the Nirbhaya case that I mentioned before, but people also pointed to, which I found fascinating, Dr. Blasey Ford's testimony at Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation. Um, and while I couldn't form out the quotes to fit into a slide, um, I thought it was fascinating that multiple participants um, shared about Dr. Blasey Ford's testimony as being empowering for them to define what they experienced as sexual violence, because that was one of the first times they heard somebody go out in public and talk about something that somebody could not point out and say, that was rape. And so that was wrong. Because Dr. Blasey Ford's experience was sexually violent, um, and not fitting into that category of a stranger assault or a stranger rape, um, they were able to kind of see more similarities in their experience and hers, which was very interesting to me. Um, and the other things that they mentioned as being helpful with societal change is TV shows validating some of the nuances of sexual violence and what it looks like and what the effects look like. Um, uh, specifically, I saw people highlight Big Little Lies, which uh, if any of you have seen, it's on HBO. It does share interesting um, dynamics of both domestic violence and sexual violence within the show um, that do talk about the difference between consent and not consent and what is violence and what is not violence. Um, the next theme, and so societal change, I was fascinated by this, cannot wait to delve into this more, which I'll talk about. And then empowering others was the other sub theme within this last theme. And um, this is where I talked about at the beginning of this um, whole presentation that it really gives me hope. Um, the participants overwhelmingly acknowledged wanting to break the cycle of silence that influenced their own processing of their sexual violence. So this um, quote, I think, sums it up. She says, we'll do better for our kids. One conversation that I've had, one of my cousins, she has a three-year-old son right now. One of the things we've talked about is that when we have kids, I think one of the ways to break the cycle is you have to teach your children that just because someone is older than you, you don't make them your elder. I can't really do much for the 16-year-old I was, but I'm hoping that this is a way I can give back to somebody in some way. I want to acknowledge that that is a hard thing to do in South Asian culture. Uh, respect for elders is a huge part of it. Um, understanding that you have to develop your own understanding of your experience is a big move for somebody. So this quote really stood out to me that they were not only acknowledging that they need to break the cycle for future generations, but that one of the parts of the cycle they need to break is a critical part of what they understand as respect and community. 
So I'm moving to taking up so much time. I'm moving to the important implications that I've got into for counseling and advocacy. So for counseling, it is critical that we understand shame development in the South Asian community because there are many layers and many factors to why the shame is so strong and the self-blame is so strong in the South Asian survivor population. I also saw that because we had so many participants, uh, all the participants talked about how they entered into a counseling relationship without sorry, not for their sexual violence, but for some other need, I saw that we need as counselors to engage in trauma assessment from the outset so that we are finding out whether or not sexual violence is at play for how they are feeling about themselves and the narratives they've created around themselves. We also need to navigate ideological barriers in being sexual, sexually violated and seeking support. Some of this is cultural and social stigma and bias. And those are hard to tear down, but there are parts of people's culture that are beautiful that they want to keep. And there are parts of their cultural upbringing that they may align with, but are also tearing apart their self-concept, their self-esteem and their understanding of where blame and shame lie in their experience. Advocacy is the other critical part of what I took away from the study. First is that I understood the impact of societal change and everyday activism at both individual and systemic levels. I think in most studies, they have talked about the importance of somebody being able to bridge the gap between the survivor and a formal mental health service and how critical it is for first responders, crisis workers, et cetera, um, and even uh, in our case, university workers to be able to say, hey, there's somebody that you can talk to about this. However, there hasn't been much research into how societal level changes in both media and social media have impacted people's self-perception of their um, experience of sexual violence. Um, I also think that there needs to be a little bit more advocacy in the bridging the gap process. We talk a lot about first responders, uh, first responders and crisis responders and university employees um, helping people connect to mental health services. But so many of our survivors talked about their family and friends being those people that help them seek support. So there needs to be additional advocacy in non-professional environments. So whether that be community events, school uh, events, et cetera, where people are explaining that this is how you talk to somebody when they've experienced sexual violence. And this is where you can lead them to, these are the supports that exist. Further, there does need to be some more advocacy. And I think all of my counseling and uh, counseling mental health folks on this call will probably agree with me. There does need to be greater advocacy for understanding collectivist counseling. A lot of our work and theories are focused on individualistic values and counseling from an individualistic lens. However, that wouldn't necessarily be compatible with somebody that's grown up with collectivist values. And then finally, we need to break down some of the barriers to accessing mental health. Um, our participants shared that, um, you know, they were hesitant to share with their parents that they were going. So people shared that financial and insurance barriers became uh, barriers for them in seeking support. And we, I don't know what, I don't know what the solution is, but we do need to do some more advocacy and how we um, go forward with our profession and creating access to our work that is a little less of an obstacle. Um, and finally, I'm going to end with my future directions. I am now trying to work to understand the positive counseling experience of survivors. What was it that they experienced that was positive? Um, I got just kind of the empathy, the validation and the empathic responses, but I wanna know more. I wanna know more about the actual interventions used, possibly theory used by um, their counselors and therapists that actually helped the survivors.
um, in the South Asian population. I also want to understand the impact of media and counseling on mental health um, and increase passive education about sexual violence and availability and types of supports. And when I say increase uh, passive education, I mean, I am looking for grants, folks, where I can create passive education materials and active education materials that can be disseminated in the community about both sexual violence and mental health support so that um, more of those informal supports are aware of what, what they need to do when somebody comes to them with um, their experience. Uh, right now, just to let you all know, I am working on understanding the media aspects. I am doing a mixed methods exploratory analysis of AAPI, what we're calling edufluencing that was taken from other scholars, um, which includes the South Asian community to understand the mental health edu, so education influencing people are doing on um, social media, specifically Instagram. And I'm also trying to do some qualitative interviews with counselors that have experienced sexual violence to understand, and I use counselors very specifically because they're, um, I have access to them, first of all, and second of all, um, to be able to understand how they take such a traumatic experience, process it, through, go through a graduate program, and then start working with others um, in such a trauma-ridden environment. So I'm, these are my references. I'm not going to go through all of these because that's a lot of time, but I want to say thank you. This is a time to get <laughs> questions and thoughts. I have 10 more minutes. And these are QR codes for two of my uh, articles that have been published on this topic. Another one is in press and another one is, I have to send another revise and resubmit by February. So feel free to download the article if you are more interested and if I spoke too fast for you all to understand. But yes, questions, thoughts, grant opportunities, happy to hear. Dr. Das, thank you so much indeed for a really, really uh, challenging, but also really educational uh, last 45 minutes for me at least, uh, just really looking at the contours of your work and the importance and timeliness of your work as well. I know that Dean Foyer has also joined us um, um, for, the, uh, for the session. So welcome Dean Foyer. Um, and um, at this point, um, if you would like to ask Dr. Das a question or make a comment, then please raise your hand uh, with, uh, with regard to um, uh, her presentation. I know Bagmi will probably get a lot more questions than the next 10, 15 or 20 minutes can hold. Uh, but um, I'll first ask Dean Foyer if he would like to make a comment um, or ask a question and then we'll uh, open it up to the rest of the audience. Thank you, Dean Foyer. Thank you so much. Uh, apologies that I could only come on a little bit later, uh, but I did uh, listen very attentively to what you're working on, Bagmi, and I'm, I just want to commend you for research in an area that uh, is so uh, deep in its relevance and touches on issues that are for so many people you know, what we somewhat casually refer to as pain points, but these are more than pain points. And you're, you're doing something that has tremendous uh, potential and great value. Can I ask um, just a, a question on one of the themes that you, uh, you discussed and that you're working on, which has to do with this, um, what I think is a quite pervasive, uh, shall we say, ph phenomenon in the way victims are blamed for their circumstances. And you have concentrated here on certain aspects of that in the South Asian community, which is of course, tremendously important. And I just am curious whether in addition to the, well, let me just make one comment. And that is that the pain experienced by victims that's brought about by others either insinuating or explicitly challenging the victims in terms of their own responsibility for their circumstances is something that I think is really quite 
pervasive. Um, I know a little bit of this literature in a different sphere, but I would I would encourage you to read some of the writings of somebody named Prima Levy, who talked about the experience of survivors of concentration camps and what it meant when they were then either intentionally or inadvertently made to feel that they were being held responsible, accountable, or to some extent to blame. And it, it, is, it, is, a, it is something that causes monumental pain in, in victims. My question is, is there any research on what motivates those who are doing the blaming of the victims? And I've always puzzled about what is it that's going on in the minds and hearts of people who are interacting with victims whose almost uh, involuntary reflexive responses to say, well, what were you doing that brought that on? And why didn't you do more to get yourself out of that situation, et cetera, et cetera? Do we have any kind of theoretical understanding or empirical understanding of what motivates people to have that kind of reaction? If that's too long a question, we can get together over lunch someday and you can, you can, we can keep the conversation going. That's what came to mind. Thank you for asking that. I don't think it's too long of a question. I just think that parts of that are addressed in research and parts are not. I think there is an overwhelming cultural, and when I say cultural, I mean that very broadly, societal, um, tendency to blame the victim. Um, however, in specifically with the South Asian research, what I found to be very, um, to, to be pervasive is this continued, and this is why I use the words breaking the cycle, is this continued cycle of blame. Um, often people have either experienced or seen somebody experience sexual violence that then was they, they conceptualize that through, it was their fault. Uh, then they raise children similarly with those same things of like, it's, the, it's your fault. There's also, um, interestingly in psychology, I think there's been this idea of how do we <clears throat> feel like we have some semblance of control <laughs> when bad things happen um, and think bad things happening like COVID and we feel like we don't have any control, we react very poorly to it. But when we do think we have some control and we can blame people for not wearing this or not doing or wearing that, et cetera, then we um, feel better about our likelihood of being, of being victimized in this case less. I don't know if that helped to explain, but I do think that there is a broader conversation about why this has always existed in blaming the victim um, that I don't think we've quite dealt with, at least I, that I've seen in the research. Thank you so much. Very much.